Hello, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending where you are. And thank you for joining this webinar. My name is Noam Shendar. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Zadara Storage. And our topic today will be to cloud or not to cloud. That is not the question. I see some people streaming in still, so I will spend just a little bit of time on logistics before I launch into the main content of the webinar. If you have questions at any time during the webinar, there's a questions button right above uh, the slides, and you can click on that and enter a question. I will see the questions come in, and I will most likely pause uh, multiple times during the presentation to answer the questions, and then, of course, again, at the end of the presentation, if there are any remaining unanswered questions, I will field those as well. Uh, I will have some polls, some voting during the presentation, both to help me understand who you are and also to keep this interactive rather than a monologue on, on my end. There's an attachments button. This is where you can download the presentation right now. So I've pre-uploaded it uh, to, to the Bright Talk website. And there are also two links in there for more information uh, about the Zadar storage services, both on-premises in the cloud, uh, for your reference later after the after the presentation. And then the last tab to know about is the ratings tab. I would very much appreciate after the talk your feedback regarding the presentation. It helps me greatly uh, to learn what you liked and what you did not. With that, I would like to begin. So again, welcome to cloud or not to cloud. That is not the question. And let's launch right into it. What I'm going to cover today are three topics. One is cover different types of storage. This is a foundational piece to make sure we're all thinking about uh, the same thing as we go through the remain remainder of the presentation. Talk about locations, different places where the storage can be. And you can guess from the title of this presentation, I'll look at how storage in the cloud differs from storage on-premises and how the two can talk to each other. And that's where the third piece comes in, which is the storage connectivity. And then, of course, I'll tie it all together at the very end. So here's our very first question. I'd love to know where you are. Uh, it is 11 o'clock here in the morning here on the West Coast. I'm going to guess that most of you are in the Americas, but other options are Europe, Middle East, or Africa as option B, Asia, Oceania, Pacific Islands as option C. And just because I was uh, being funny when I wrote this, uh, maybe, maybe you're logging in from the International Space Station. So with that, I'll open this first uh, poll. Please click on A for Americas, B, EMEA, C, APAC or D, none of the above. I'll give it about 20 more seconds. Very good. So as as I guessed, we are we are uh, heavily concentrated in the Americas. Let's move on. I believe I have one more question for you before I move on. Uh, I'm wondering about your storage background. Are you an A storage guru, B an advanced user, C an intermediate user, or D a novice? I'll open this voting as well. So again. From A to most advanced to D, the least advanced, I'd love to know where you are on that spectrum. This will help me calibrate the, the rest of the presentation to keep it both interested, but also make sure I don't leave anyone behind. I'll give it about 20 seconds longer. 
Uh, we are concentrated in the middle of the spectrum from inter intermediate to advanced. Actually, what I was hoping for. Very well. Thank you for entering your votes. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on to my my largely North American and largely intermediate and advanced audience. So this is this is a recap of different types of storage again to make sure we're all on the same page. And so I will cover three types of storage in the following order: object storage, file storage, and block storage. So let's start with objects. When when most people think of cloud storage, this is what comes to mind. Object storage was launched uh, most famously by Amazon Web Services around 2006. Uh, they call it S3. S3 stands for Simple, um, Simple Storage Service, SSS or S3. And it is, as the name promises, it's very simple. It uses the HTTP protocol, which is the same protocol is what our browsers use, and uh, and therefore it's very easy to integrate it into um, existing existing websites, for example. Any any existing browser can pull files directly from object storage. The simplicity also comes from very basic functionality. In essence, object storage is only two functions. You can put a file into object storage and you can get it out of object storage. So you can think of it as an uploading file and downloading it back out. And that's what makes it so simple. It also, uh, and by the way, makes it very, very powerful for those applications where that's all you need. For example, I mentioned websites. Uh, also, you can think about uh, movie or media services. So, for example, Netflix uses object storage and specifically Amazon Web Services S3 to uh, to store the movies, uh, and it should make perfect sense. The, the movie needs to be uploaded once by Netflix into the object store and then can be downloaded on demand by anybody. And I'll point out something that is implicit in everything I've said so far, and that is you may have noticed that I, I didn't mention that there's an opportunity to change the file. You can add it and you can uh, you can download it, but you don't. You actually can't change it, which means object storage is very good for static content and is not good for content that is changing. Ex an example: Let's say you let's say you have a file and you want to change one bit in the file. Maybe you want to change the maybe it's a it's a um, a graphic and you want to change the background color of the graphic. Even though you only need to change one bit, you would need to re-upload the entire file because there's no there's no mechanism for changing files, only for uploading and downloading. So this is where object storage, uh, though it's wonderful and it's incredibly successful, uh, is not appropriate for all applications. And in fact, if you look at traditional enterprise type applications, the collaboration suites, inter enterprise resource planning, um, uh, CRM packages, databases, and so forth, those actually cannot take advantage of object for, for these reasons because these are applications with dynamic content and they need the ability to modify either databases or files on the fly. So that brings me to type number two, which is file storage. File storage is by far the most common type of storage in the enterprise. Uh, by most analyst estimates, it's 80% of, of capacity within the enterprise is file-based capacity, and that should make sense. Almost everything that we do is file-based. Our presentations, our, our reports, all of those things are file-based. And, and the really nice thing about file-based storage is that it works using the metaphors that we are very familiar with, which are files and folders. Um, so that's, that's where file, file storage comes in. It really is behind most of the things that we do on, an, on a day, daily basis. Um, and there's there, so they only leaves a few things that aren't well served. And I mentioned databases before, and that's that's one of those areas. Databases actually don't have need for files. They really just need have a need for entries. And in addition, very importantly, they have a need to be able to update those entries very 
quickly and frequently. So if you think of a database with lots and lots and lots of little, let's call them uh, cubby holes, then you need the ability to access those cubby holes very often and make those changes swiftly to the data that resides there, and also, of course, to retrieve the data. So that's where the third type of storage comes in, which is block storage. So block storage is typically what databases use, and they use it because it's it's ideally suited for what I just described. It's ideally suited for making many in rapid small changes to a given data set. This is sometimes known as structured data because the changes happen in very specific places, whereas the file storage is unstructured. You could also guess, because file storage is about 80% of enterprise data, that block storage is about 20%, the remaining 20% of enterprise data. So if you look at this overview, one point I'd like to make is object is incredibly successful and incredibly good, but it doesn't serve all all uh, use cases out there. And most enterprise use cases rely on the tradition, more traditional uh, storage types, which are the file and block. And in this presentation, I'll focus on the latter two, largely because object storage, uh, because of the limitations of the object storage, but also object storage is well understood. Uh, if, you th if you think about object storage, it works well. In fact, it works incredibly well. It's in very easy. It's ubiquitous. Every cloud provider out there has it, and there are also good and easy ways to procure object storage on-premises, and both from open source uh, companies and uh, and also from um, from closed source ones. So I, for the purpose of this presentation, let's consider object storage as solved, and let's concentrate instead on the file file and block uh, part of the uh, equation or the spectrum. By the way, I put a little quote in here from uh, which I took straight out of Microsoft's um, application note for for um, Microsoft SQL Server, their database, and you can see here that they recommend block storage for databases. So sort of the, the default way of running a database is on block storage. So the quote is, Microsoft recommends that you store database files either on local disk subsystems or in storage area networks, SANS for short, and those are both uh, block block storage uh, devices or or um, uh, or systems. Excellent. Okay, so out there there's object file and block. In this, for the rest of this presentation, I'll focus on the latter two on file and block because of those those are the two most prevalent in the enterprise, and they're they are together make make up just about 100% of uh, enterprise storage capacity. So let's talk about where where storage resides, because that's changing. And I think it's a very interesting discussion to see uh, what things remain the same and what, what things uh, are changing, or at least have an opportunity to change. Which brings me to polling question number three. The, for, for, by the way, some have joined since I started, so I'll, I'll mention that there are buttons at the top, all of which are useful. The questions button, if you want to ask me questions. Votes, this is where the, this vote, uh, the voting question will become active shortly. Attachments are downloads and links that you can use now or after the presentation. And ratings, please provide your feedback after the presentation. I, w I would personally appreciate it. So, uh, polling question number three. Where do you have storage? Is your storage A, on premises, B, is it off-premises, C, is it both, or D, is, is it in neither place? In other words, you don't have storage. So I'll start this, uh, this vote. Again, the choices are A, on-premises, B, is off, C, is both of those locations, on and off, and D, not really relevant to you, you don't have storage. About 30 seconds more for the voting. Thank you for those who have voted so far. We are uh, looking at a nice mix of purely on, purely off, and hybrid, which is both. About 10 more seconds. Very good. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you again for voting. So we have more, uh, the most on-premises, a majority on-premises, which is no surprise. That is the traditional way of implementing enterprise storage. And then we have um, an emerging off-premises uh, category. And then in between, the second largest category is, is both, which also makes sense because uh, one is more likely when taking advantage of off-premises storage of keeping, at least for the time being, the on-premises environment. Good. So let's continue with the locations, possible locations for storage. So uh, as, as we all know, storage can go on-premises or off or both. And one way of connecting the two is via something called a gateway. Uh, and I'll refer to it in the next slide, so I just wanted to define it here to make sure that we, again, we're all on the same page. So the the gateway is a device that resides on premises and which provides access to storage that is in the cloud or somewhere off premises. In other words, the gateway itself doesn't have any storage, but it provides access, usually using ex existing compatible protocols, to cloud-based storage. So a classic example uh, to use in an, I'm using Amazon Web Services just because of their their uh, because of their si their sheer size, the fact that they are notorious in the in the positive sense of the word. So now they have a, an AWS storage gateway, and it's a uh, it's it's actually a, a software, but let's think of it as a device, an appliance that resides on premises and provides access on premises to S3 uh, in in uh, Amazon's own cloud. And the idea is the servers that reside on premises now have access to that storage. Now the what this appliance can't do is is eliminate the latency that exists because of the distance between the on-premises environment and the off-premises environment. So it makes the access easier but not faster. It can provide some caching, which can help to uh, to a degree, especially if the data set is small, but caching, too, has its limits. And at, at the end of the day, physics dictates that there's a certain latency between the on-premises environment and the off-premises environment. So just wanted to clarify uh, gateways, because I'll refer to them very shortly again. Gateways are devices that present remote storage locally, but the, the actual storage is remote. So with that, with that clarification, let's look at this uh, chart, which looks at, asks, where is the storage? Is it on-premises or off-premises? And where is the application? Is it on-premises or off? So starting at the bottom left of this slide, it's on and on. On-premises servers with on-premises storage, and that is the traditional IT environment. That's how we've all been doing IT for decades now. The storage is here. The servers are here. They're connected to each other locally, meaning with very high bandwidth and uh, very low latency, and it, that works very well. And the only limitation, of course, is it, my, my capacity, uh, both compute capacity and storage capacity, is limited to what I have, and I don't, I don't uh, have an easy way to grow that. In other words, I have to buy more and wait for it to arrive. Let's go diagonally to the top right. The, the, and that is everything is off-premises. My storage is off-premises and my application uh, or servers are, are off-premises. What's that? That's cloud computing. That's the Amazon Web Services model, Microsoft Azure model, um, et cetera, et cetera, any cloud uh, provider that you can name. So er everything is still co-located with each other. The, the, the servers and the storage are in the same place, but now they're off-premises. And because they're provided as a service, they they have the advantage of the ela of elasticity. So one can very easily add capacity or subtract capacity, both for compute and for storage, as needed to meet uh, shifting shifting needs. So I think those two are very clear models: the top top right and the bottom left. Everything off premises or everything on. The the top left. The storage is off-premises, but the application is on-premises. That's the storage gateway that we just discussed. So this is uh, this is how one would connect storage to uh, storage that is remote to servers that are local. And as I mentioned, that if the if the application performance requirements are modest and the data sets are small enough, this works quite well. Uh, but as soon as either of those conditions becomes false, then then the the system becomes far less useful because latency and internet bandwidth limitations 
to get, and it's very hard to move a lot of data quickly along uh, across the long distances. And I'll, I'll refer I'll refer again to this limitation in a little bit. The last quadrant on this slide is the bottom right quadrant, and that's the situation where my storage is on premises, but my application is off premises. That's a fairly rare situation, and not and and I actually had a hard time coming up with a scenario or use case that would fit this. The only one that I uh, could sort of conceive of was the disaster recovery scenario uh, it, during during a disaster. For example, um, I have um, um, I have my storage. I, I started with a tra traditional IT environment, the one the blue circle on the bottom left, the dark blue, and my computer environment went down, but my storage environment is still up and running, and I have servers somewhere else. And therefore, I'm able to continue working, although potentially more slowly, by connecting the remote servers to the local storage. So that that could be could be a scenario. Although the the legitimate question is why didn't the local storage fail as well? And it's a fair question. If something something catastrophic happened to the servers locally, most likely the same thing happened to the storage as well. Um, another potential. Uh, a potential scenario or use case is a migration. So I'm in the middle of a migration, so I haven't yet moved my data to the remote location, so I'm still operating in some sort of a hybrid mode where my data is here and my computer is somewhere else, but eventually everything else will be at the remote location the somewhere else. So to summarize, the typically the storage and the compute are in the same place. And that provides for the most performance and the least latency and the most throughput and so forth. And it is conceivable to have the the compute environment local or on-premises and the storage off-premises. And it's fairly rare and, and of questionable value to go the other way with the storage on-premises and the, and the application environment off-premises. So let's talk now after discussing where things are, how they connect to each other. And and one of the things that I'll uh, that I'll touch on is that that hybrid scenario where you want things in two places that are not close to each other and how do you how do you optimally manage that and deal with latencies and uh, throughput limitations and so forth. Which brings me to my last polling question for for this webinar. And to the extent that you have on-premises storage, where is it? Is it? Do you have your own data center? Do you use a co-location facility? For those who aren't familiar with the term, that's a that's a, a, data, a data center where one can rent space and power to place their IT equipment. Uh, so it's a shared facility, generally very secure and with very reliable power. Um, that was option B. C is, this isn't relevant to me, I don't have on-premises storage. And D, I don't really know. I know I have storage, but I don't know where it is. So let me let me start the, the vote here. And I'll remind you of the, of the choices. A, my on-premises storage is in my own data center. B, my on-premises storage is at a co-location facility. The third choice, C, is that I don't have on-premises storage, and the last choice, D, is I'm not really sure. About 20 seconds. The votes are streaming in. Skewed toward the traditional model, which is the on-premises. Second is co-location. And third is no on-premises storage. Excellent. So well, the votes are received, say, half in, in one's own data center, and then the remaining half is split about two-thirds uh, toward the co-location facility and one-third uh, no on-premises storage. Very good. Thank you. So 
Uh, so let's look at um, let's look at different location for storage and how how the connectivity works. So on premises, it's very straightforward. I have my storage, I have my compute, and they're connected via a common network. It could be a uh, a LAN, so it could be an Ethernet based network. It could also be a storage fabric like Fiber Channel uh, or InfiniBand. And the traditionally traditionally on premises storage was very heavily skewed toward fabric, but uh, IP-based storage or land-based storage is um, is growing very quickly, uh, so that I, iSCSI is becoming um, a larger and larger category and more and more dominant. And then uh, iSCSI and iSCSI, one of the advantages for iSCSI is taking advantage of faster and faster speeds at Ethernet, whereas um, fiber channel is growing in multiples of two, from one gigabit per second to two to four to uh, to 8 to 16 and potentially to 32, although the present generation is 16, Ethernet generally grows a multiple of 10 from from uh, 100 megabits to a gigabit to 10 gigabit um, and eventually to 100. Today it's at 40 or 56 gigabits depending uh, depending on the vendor, and um, and which means that already today the Ethernet uh, Ethernet based uh, interconnects are faster than the fastest that uh, fiber channel has to offer. Uh, also cheaper, and um, and recently also enhanced by by uh, well fairly recently enhanced by um, additions uh, to to iSCSI like um, iWarp and iSER. I won't get into those, but uh, suffice it for this context to say they are enhancements to iSCSI to improve the performance and, and increase uh, the consistency of the performance. So on-premises storage is fairly straightforward. There's a switch of some sort, and both the servers and the storage are plugged into that switch. The We mentioned the gateway before, but there's another way to connect traditional on-premises storage to, to the cloud. And uh, it comes by m many different names. Typically, they're brand names provided by and, and coined by the various service providers. Uh, Amazon Web Services has something called Direct Connect. Microsoft Azure is something called Express Route, and there are other equivalent services from other services from other uh, cloud providers. And what they do is they provide a peering point and location with the cloud. So, say that I had a piece of storage that I wanted to connect to Amazon Web Services with very low latency and high throughput, I obviously couldn't use the, a gateway and I couldn't use uh, the public Internet because of the limitations on on throughput um, and, uh, and latency. So what I would do is I would uh, use this Direct Connect or Express Route type service. I would take the storage and put it not not in my private data center, which is one reason why I asked the previous polling question, I would put it at co-location, which is, a, as I mentioned, a building where you can rent uh, space and power for your IT equipment. It would be a facility specified by the cloud provider as a peering location. And then I would use the service, Direct Connect or Express Route, to connect with very, very low latency and very high throughput. Um, we ourselves at Zabara Storage use these services extensively. So we can we have uh, we can attest to their uh, capabilities. We're talking about millisecond latency. Uh, something's better. We're talking about any any multiple of 10 gigabits per second of uh, of uh, dedicated bandwidth. So very fast and very very low latency. So it, which is by the way another way of saying that one way to get traditional on-premises storage to connect to a public cloud with all the performance is to move it physically closer to the cloud. Um, now, let's talk a little bit for the next couple of slides about moving the data around, which is another way of saying replication. Why would you want to replicate? Because, as I mentioned, if you use the gateway, then then you're limited to data sets that are sufficient, sufficiently small and latency tolerant and um, and not performance sensitive so that they can live within the limitations of the latency and, and bandwidth and restricted bandwidth between the, the on-premises location and the cloud. Well, if you had a way of copying the data so that you had the same data both on-premises and near the cloud and you or in the cloud for that matter, then you could uh, continuously update it so that you have updated copies at both ends of this, the on-premises end and the cloud end, then 
life would be pretty good because you could do the work you wanted to do in the cloud and you could do the work that you wanted to do on premises. You wouldn't have to choose, which is really the thesis of mine. My talk today is there's not necessarily a good reason to think of cloud and on premises as an exclusive, a mutually exclusive proposition. And actually, uh, the two coexist really well. So, uh, there are two ways to replicate the data to the extent that you want the data to live in multiple places at once. One is known as synchronous replication and the other as asynchronous. As the name synchronous replication implies, you, when you synchronously replicate, you have multiple copies of the data that are perfect copies of each other. They are always in perfect sync with each other. When you do that, you get to do some really neat things. For example, what I'm showing here is what we call multi-zone high availability or MZHA for short. With MZHA, because I have two perfect copies of the data that are perfectly in sync in two different physical locations, then I can create a highly resilient system that continues to run uninterrupted even in the face of a facility level failure, which by the way is one of the most common questions that we get from customers with mission critical application. They say, we understand that your system is very reliable, however, what happens if the lights go out in the building? And we say, of course, that then the system would go down. If you, you know, as resilient as our system is, it still needs power. It's not, um, you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't have a um, built-in power source. So, uh, the end, but life doesn't have to be um, like that because with multi-zone HA, which takes advantage of synchronous replication, the customer can have the data live in uh, two buildings uh, and, and select the two buildings such that the odds of both buildings suffering a failure simultaneously would be very, very small, infinitesimally and acceptably low. In which case, the, with synchronous replication, one gets a high availability system resilient against all the normal failures, drive failures and controller failures and so forth, and facility level failures. And that's a very, very cool thing that provides a lot of comfort with regard to application uptime. So that's synchronous replication and one very good use for synchronous replication. There's also asynchronous replication and the it, it, asynchronous replication is what you do when you can't replicate synchronously. As you can imagine, if you can replicate synchronously, you probably want to because you have two perfect copies of the data. But that's not possible where the latency is high. For example, when you go across great distances, if you wanted to replicate from the west here, the west coast of the U.S., to the east coast of the U.S., or between Europe and the U.S., or between Asia and the U.S., any of those are uh, rep uh, require replication across very long distances with high latency. And in those uh, situations, synchronous replication won't work because synchronous replication requires having identical data at both places, which means one has to wait for the data to be updated, the remote site, before proceeding to ensure the perfect synchronicity between the two sites. And if you do this across an ocean, as an example, your application will slow to a crawl because everything that you do at one location has to cross the ocean, happen at the other location, and you have to wait for an acknowledgement from the other location that you may continue. So in those situations, you don't synchronously replicate. Rather, you do what's called asynchronous replication, which does create a copy and a continually updated copy of the data at the remote location. However, it is not a, a, an up-to-the-transaction copy, but rather there's a delay. The delay is configurable. It could be a one minute delay. It could be longer. And what it means is that at the primary location, I have my perfect copy. And then at the remote location, I have a recent copy, let's say a one minute old copy or a 15 minute old copy. Uh, and because this replication does not require synchronicity, then it can happen over any distance. So what you gain is distance and what you lose is that synchronicity, that perfect uh, bit by bit copy at any given point in time. Why would you asynchronously replicate? Well, one could be migration. You just need to move the data from one place to another. Maybe the company headquarters shifted or you found a cheaper place in which to store the data. Another is disaster recovery. So if I have two copies of the data in two distant locations, then the odds of a single natural disaster taking out both locations or even the odds of two natural disasters happening at the same time 
are extremely low, acceptably low. So, and, and better in the event of a disaster, it's better to have a copy that's a few minutes old and, uh, than having no copy at all. So the, the trade-off is good. And then one more possibility is the global workflow where a company has multiple sites and works in shifts. Uh, a co very, very uh, common example is the creative industry, for example, um, the movie industry. And in the movie industry, it's very common to have digital artists work in one location and then hand off to artists in a different location many time zones away so that the work continues around the clock. So this uh, large studios may have locations in uh, in Hollywood and in India and somewhere in uh, in Europe, so that each each works an eight hour shift and together that's a twenty four hour day. In terms of where to replicate from and to, it's really anywhere to anywhere. So one could go from on premises to on premises. Maybe I, I'm a large company of multiple locations, so I can use this asynchronous replication to copy the data from one office to another office that's distant. I can do it cloud to cloud within either within a service provider, for example, Amazon East to Amazon West, or even among clouds. We have customers who uh, would like to move data from one provider to another provider, again, for disaster recovery reasons. If, if there's a catastrophic failure at one provider, then there's the ability to run at the other provider. And then also you can mix and match. You can, do, you can replicate data between the on-premises environment and the cloud or vice versa, uh, and that's actually a very, very good scenario for disaster recovery because perhaps I have my, uh, my private data center as my on-premises environment, and I would like to have a disaster recovery site, but I don't want to buy or build that site. Well, a cloud is perfect for that because I don't have to buy anything, and I can have an on-demand environment that I activate only as needed in the event of a disaster. So my costs, my upfront costs for this disaster recovery site are zero, literally, and my ongoing costs are very low because I'm not spending uh, money and resources that I'm not using. So that's the asynchronous replication. It's really anywhere to anywhere on the globe, and there are many good reasons to use it, and it's a good way to, another good way to mix the on-premises environment with the cloud environment. And this uh, method also solves the latency problem because I do have a copy at the remote location that I can operate on. So I don't have to operate on data that's remote to me, and therefore I, um, I don't have a latency issue, and I don't have a bandwidth or throughput issue. So now let's cover everything or put to, put together everything that that I described until now. So if, if you recall, if you were here from the beginning, I talked about different storage types, and I talked about um, the where the storage can reside, be it on premises or or off premises or both, and then how to connect those various environments to each other, and how to copy data in various methods and in various directions. So. Really, the ideal uh, is that my storage is not either in the cloud or on-premises, but it's both. It's where I need it, when I need it, and I use replication, either synchronous or asynchronous or both. Again, not mutually exclusive, but I can tailor my approach for what I need. And, and even better, it would be uh, very, very good if I had the same storage in both locations. Not in the, not in the sense of I wish... Um, uh, not in the sense of vendor, but more in the sense of management paradigm. I don't want to have to manage my storage off-premises differently from the way that I manage storage on-premises because that's inefficient, because it requires multiple skill sets and may require different uh, different packages or, or monitoring systems to do. So but far better if I can have my data where I need it when I need it. I can move it where I need it when I need it. And regardless of where I move it to, way that I consume the data and manage the data does not change. And this, what I just described, so having the data when I need it, where I need it, when I need it, and managing it the same way is exactly what what we do. So to, to very briefly pitch uh, what we do at Zadar Storage is we provide you what we call the VPSA, which is the virtu Virtual Private Storage Array. You can have a VPSA on-premises. You can have a VPSA in a public cloud of your choice. You can have VPSA at a co-location facility of your choice, and you can replicate synchronously or asynchronously back and forth, and not just point-to-point, point, but point-to-multipoint as needed. So it's not just 
point A to B, but you can go from A to B and C, et cetera, et cetera. And it's exactly the same storage in every respect, the same software, the same hardware, the same APIs, the same management paradigms, the same metaphors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and all using the same business model, a cloud business model as a service. So that means uh, everything is by the hour. You pay not for what you have, but for what you use. And if you shrink your usage, then, then your payment also shrinks accordingly. So a true cloud business model. So full-fledged storage with all the capabilities. File and block, as I mentioned in the very beginning, not, not object, but rather the common enterprise protocols, NFS, SIFs, iSCSI, um, and, and pr provided by the hour. So, the, so traditional, traditional storage, highly capable, highly available, with a multi-zone high availability, high, high availability that I described, and uh, with pure cloud, best, best of all worlds, all the flexibility of cloud and all the power and capability of traditional storage. That was the one-minute one pitch about what we do. Um, and to summarize it all, and please, if you do have the time, ask questions and provide feedback. So the questions button at the top, there's a ratings button at the top for feedback. Uh, there's also an attachments button at the top. Uh, that um, uh, has this presentation in PDF format, as well as a couple of links back to the Zadar Storage website describing both the on-premises offering and the in-cloud offering. So to put it all together, with Zadar Storage, you get storage both on-premises and in the cloud, so you don't have to choose between the two, it's exactly the same service, it's exactly the same management paradigm, and it's exactly the same business model, which is the cloud business model, which is flexible and easy and does not have long-term commitments, and, and of course elastic and grow and shrink, both capacity and performance as needed. And what that means to you if you are looking at procuring storage is that it does not require you to choose between using the cloud and using uh, your traditional on-premises environment, you can use one, you can use the other, you can use the both, you can use them both, but even more importantly, you can change your mind anytime, which is part of the really fundamental underlying philosophy behind everything that we do, which is things change and we need to enable you to change uh, along with those things. We don't, we, we, we never want you um, uh, stuck or painted into a corner. So everything is reversible. Every single decision you make can be changed, including moving from the cloud to on-premises or vice versa, from on-premises to the cloud. With that, <clears throat> I'm going to thank you for your time. I'm going to provide my contact information. If you please ask me questions now via the questions button, but if questions come to you later um, or there's any reason why you want to reach out to me directly, you can see my Twitter handle, you can see my phone number, you can see my email address. And um, I will uh, stay on the line for a couple more minutes. This is scheduled until 45 minutes after the hour, so I'll stay, I'll stay on the line until then to see if you have any questions. You click on the questions button, type in your question, and I will answer them. And once again, one last time, thank you very much for paying attention, for voting, participating, taking uh, time out of your busy day to participate. I really appreciate it. Before you leave, please push the ratings button and uh, provide, provide feedback. It's extremely helpful to me. Thanks very much. With this, I will end the webcast. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the ratings. And um, I, I hope to hear from you again. And enjoy the rest of your days or evenings.